here today with Simcha Frischling, who is the founder of Call of the Chauffeur, which some of you might know about, others might not. Tune in, and I hope you enjoy the interview. Hey, Simcha. Hi. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. So, it's funny, someone just yesterday described to me I I told a good friend of mine I'm interviewing the call the founder of the call of the chauffeur and he he said I should really call it the founder of the Jewish Fight Club, because um, <laughs> the first rule about Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club, right? Um, but we're, it's a good movie. Yeah, so we're gonna break that seal a little bit. Um, I thought maybe you could just introduce yourself and uh, just. Really, two, three minutes, just give a, a very short, I mean, because we'll get into it, a little, it will just come up organically, but just a very quick overview of, of what you th- of, of what uh, Call of the Chauffeur is, really. So, yeah, I created this organization called Call of the Chauffeur, and it's been in existence for about 12 years. It evolved out of a men's group that I was part of which started probably about 20 years ago in Baltimore. There was a group of 10 men that decided to meet once a week and um, use that meeting to to work on ourselves, to work on our well-being and work on the relationships in our lives. We were all Jewish men. I think we were pretty much all Bob Chuvas. And um, I had been... Well, we can talk about this too, what this means, but working on myself since I'm probably 13. Wow. I uh, had some sense of that who I was growing up into wasn't really, I wasn't really in touch with my essential self. I was very lost, very angry, very scared. Um, came from a pretty rough situation. And um, I've spent a lot of years trying to, in my language, come back home to my essential self way before I discovered Torah. Uh, And I had done a lot of workshops and worked with different types of healing modalities and a lot of different things. And then when I was about 30 years old, I discovered Torah and got involved in it and really stepped into it as a path for personal transformation, not so much as a um, traditional type thing. Anyway, so I, I was I got in, involved in this um, this men's group and really started to pay attention to what was really working in terms of my own growth. And I discovered that what seemed to be working really was um, grounded in the Torah. And I started to look at the Torah as a path of going from a, my own or our own personal Mitzrayim to our own personal home in, a, in terms of our essential selves. And that that's what the Torah really, not that the Torah is not also a historical document, but on a different octave, it's a um, it's a journey home to our essential selves and well-being. And from that place of well-being, then being capable of, of experiencing joyful intimacy with God's presence or with my wife and children or whomever. So, um, so the weekend is... Uh... Is, is basically for men to come and, and experience that return to well-being, as you said. Yeah, and it evolved out of this men's group. It, it was born out of this group. Um, and I started to, to see the different aspects of Torah that really, like, what is it? What, how do we get home? What is this 40-year journey in the Midbar? And um, yes, yeah, so I created this this experiential workshop, the three day experiential workshop, and and at this point, I think close to eighteen hundred individuals have gone through it. Wow, both that's here a lot of and in Israel. Can you can you uh, just to concretize the concept for a second? 
Can you give me one example of something that you sort of came to in your process, in your search um, towards well-being before you saw, in other words, before your embrace of Torah and then you saw that concept and it resonated with you from within a source in Torah, like one con, you know, one example? Okay. Um, it's, it's probably, it's, it's a pretty fundamental example and it's actually where the name of the, the, the organization comes from, Call of the Shofar, that if we, if we touch deep enough down that we all have a desire to come back home, that that is our, that is our bottom line ruts and or passion to come back home. Very much like um, a melody, a song, when it, as soon as it leaves the tonic, as soon as it leaves the initial note, that there is a desire, there's a leaning to come back home to come back to the tonic and that if we allow ourselves to feel deeply enough and honestly enough that ultimately we want to come home to to our essential selves and from that place be in a loving compassionate relationship and um, that became my understanding for Rosh Hashanah and I got that in particular from the teachings of Rabbi Nachman in terms of crying out from the depths uh, is really just a very simple call to remember to come back home. So, I don't know if I understood all that, but that, that's sort of an example. Okay, okay. Um, okay, so, can you, um, because... I want to ask you a couple questions, but I just want to make sure the audience understands just the basic. So, what is well-being in a couple sentences? Okay, well, well-being is a word. That I, That's, I an ambitious, scotch, That's an ambitious that I, question, but uh, just the bare bones, that? you know, the what bare bones. I said that that's an ambitious question, but... Um, yeah, okay, so I'll give you an answer, and, and it's... Uh, I, I'm sorry if it's probably isn't going to be as simple as you wanted it, but um, I really do have to rewind a little bit to answer the question. And right. rewinding means that uh, I have to I have to put down a bit of a foundation, which is this, and it's it's not too complicated. That that the whole workshop called the show for is based on a certain assumption and that assumption is this that that before creation there was whatever you want to call it undifferentiated oneness and and god and this undifferentiated oneness had a desire to give to be a matif to bestow to be loving towards and in order for that to be the case there had to be the creation of other right so now undifferentiated one became the creator of other to be the recipient of this goodness that undifferentiated one wanted to give. And so that's logical. The, the first part is an assumption that there's something before, that there's creation and there's something before creation that is loving, okay? That's an assumption. Then logically there needs to be an other, the creation of another to be the recipient of this goodness. And logically, the greatest goodness that one could bestow upon other is for other to experience intimacy with one. Okay? Okay. I mean, I mean, all right. So, this is all to answer your question, what's well-being? Sure, sure. So then, the question becomes, who do we as other have to be in order to be the recipient of this hatava, of this goodness? Or who do we as other have to be to satisfy the rutsam of the Creator? Okay? Okay. Alright, so, so now the basic ingredients of what we're calling well-being. Number okay. one is we have to be an other. We have to 
be individuated. We have to be a self. We have to have healthy boundaries. We have to be a yesh. We have to be a prata. Again, I don't know who, who I'm talking to, so I don't know if these words... No, these words are perfect. They're perfect. Okay, so that's one quality that we need to be able to embody. I need to be a self. Okay, so Another let me... quality... So let me... Uh, did you want to say? Yeah, let, instead of getting all of it right up, let's just sort of focus on each element. So... This is a really interesting idea and a very rich concept that you're talking about, which is that there is, there's a, there's a deep sense of beauty, holiness, um, and health in what we might call healthy gvura, right? Setting up boundaries, um, right? Maybe excluding others when need be, but really making sure that you know, that the person is really, I, right, let's say I, I am a, a healthy individual that is not defining myself on other people, right? Let's say that's one um, application. So, my question, so just to give a marshal on this element, this just one kernel of, of this idea before before we move on, can you give us uh, can you give me a example of interpersonal relationship where there's an unhealthy, when there's not an other, there's not room for an other, there's not there's not that space where a person's just being given, you know, space to just spread out and just just kind of be themselves. Because the reason I ask this is because I know that uh, most of the people who go to chauffeur are uh, seem to be at least uh, Lubavitchers, right? Is that correct? For the last two years, yeah. Right. Hopefully, we're going to get more people. It shouldn't just be one one niche audience, but but for the but so far it seems to be. And what's interesting about Lubavitch, especially Crown Heights, is that there is a very strong uh, community, but there's also a strong. What I've found, and what many other people have found, um, is that they come back from chauffeur, or or whatever. Maybe they didn't go to chauffeur. Maybe they're just, you know, great person, healthy person who really lives, uh, 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 takes their mental health seriously, and really develops himself, has a rich internal life. And there is a strong sense of kind of everyone commenting on the other. You see that a lot by Fabrengans which is a very Lubavitch uh, phenomenon. Fabrengans where guys come together, they're drinking, whatever. Maybe they're drinking, maybe they're not drinking so much, whatever it is. And there is often a breach of this boundary. Where a breach of what boundary? Say it again. With what, a breach they... of the boundary of that healthy gvura, of allowing someone to, yeah. to just be themselves and just nurture them as they are, right? And okay. not trying to lead them to... A different place maybe right just allowing them to be as they are maybe accepting them does acceptance tie in here or we're still well look I think you know let me I, I, I think what you under the category of healthy Kavura and I didn't use the word Kavura you used the word Kavura which is fine but I was using the word yesh or prot or individuation and that does express itself in different ways. For instance, Gavura simply is boundaries, healthy boundaries, um, being able to say no, not me not being you, you not being me, me being in touch with my own personal needs. There's another permeation of that, you might call it hode, which is me expressing my unique self. It's not necessarily having boundaries about my unique self, but expressing the unique creativity that I have the potential to be. So that's a little, you know, it's a little different shade of the same Indian. But I, I think one of the, you know, in my opinion, some of the, the misconceptions, again, my opinion, I don't want to get into the whole thing here, is this idea of Bittle, you know, where, where, um, I think there's a misconception that, well, I totally mavato, I totally negate my yeshness, my selfness, my I-ness, my having, having a healthy ego. Right. And I think, you know, ego is a word that's been 
misconstrued as well. It's important to have a healthy ego. I'm not talking about gaiva. I'm talking about having a healthy sense of self, taking care of myself, having healthy boundaries. And I think that, yes, it does get misconstrued in different communities in terms of, you know, I thought the whole point was to mavato myself. Right. I, I, I bring it up because there is a certain... I've noticed this a lot, and I don't want to just shy, skirt the issue because I think it's important to speak about. Um, there is a certain tension that people have, let's say, in Crown Heights, some people have, with guys who come back from chauffeur. Particularly, you see it because I think one of the things chauffeur does very well is that it really gets people to a place of, of telling themselves that I matter and I'm important. Um, and that's not something you hear very often, at least not in that way, in, particularly in the Chabad community, which might also tie into the phenomenon of there's such a predominance of, of Chabad going, um, or may not. But, but um, it's, it's just speaking like that in terms of like, I matter, I'm important, I need to eat, from a, eat things that show I matter, do things that show I matter, right? Work at a job that shows I matter, really just kind of standing in my shoes and walking down the street with a, a certain amount of confidence, you know. Um, that's something that, unfortunately, I, I think you're, um, has kind of become considered off-limits because of the heavy emphasis on Bittel in Chabad doctrine, in Chabad, Maimarim, Sichas, etc., which is, I, I agree with you very much, I think it's, it's misconstrued. Um, and so I think that's, that's a very interesting angle, which is like, you know, um, so many people, like I remember on, on my weekend, right, there, there were people, myself included, who, who but, but particularly I saw it even in the posture of people who came in, maybe hunched over, kind of uneasy in their chair or standing, you know, just really like not standing firmly, forcefully in their place. And then such a dramatic shift, even in a physical posture, it was really incredible to see that. Um, and, and I think, yeah, so I think the, the, the tension is between that emphasis on Bittel and then having a healthy Yashos, having a healthy Mitzias, um, which is, which is delicate, you know? Um, and I'm just curious, you know, what you think a healthy version of Bittel might look like. Okay, so we're, we're getting, I mean, I'm fine, but we're getting a little off the well-being thing for now, but I'm, you know, you're running the show. So, um, we'll, co we'll come back to it. Okay. What is healthy Bittel? Um, okay, that's a good question. And, uh, First of all, there's an, there's an expression that you have to be a somebody before you can be a nobody. I love it. I um, love it. So, first, so that's number one. In other words, it, 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 I'm not being, I'm not negating myself because I'm a shmata. I'm negating myself because I'm choosing to do that. I'm 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 putting my own needs aside out of a choice to serve either someone else or to be of service to to a greater organization or, you know, my family, my community, Hashem, whatever it is, you know, whatever construct I find my myself responsible towards. Um, so I think that comes from a place of of love for another, like I'll mavato myself because my wife has a need, my children have a need. Um, well, I guess I can mavato myself out of fear, you know, because someone or something is a lot bigger than me, and right. this is what they say to do. So, okay. Right. Um, but but what I'm hearing know, is you're mavato myself because, out of a sense of responsibility, out of a sense of because that's the greater value, and that's what I need to do. Like I don't I don't really want to go to the gym and work out today. I don't really want to go to work today. But you know, I. I'm, I'm responsible to my family or to my health, and so I do what I need to do. What I'm hearing from you is that, the, tell me if I'm right, that the main distinction is that 
healthy bittel comes when it's really a free choice that you're embracing. Um, well, you know, look, I, healthy. If I have the opportunity to make the choice, I'm a yesh making the choice. In other words, it's not, it's not not healthy that an infant doesn't have that choice. It just happens to be where that infant is in its own development. But, but the more... The more I, the more I intentionally choose to mavatel myself, that becomes that becomes a choice. It becomes then then I'm the one who's doing that. Otherwise, I'm not the one who's involved. I'm like a cork floating in the water. And if I mavatel myself, you know, so what? I'm you know, I'm a cork floating in the water. But if it's a, if it's a choice that I'm making, then I'm engaged in the relationship I'm mavateling myself for. Otherwise, I'm not really engaged in the real. Okay. It's like someone, you know, I've got this example. It's like someone points a gun to my head and tells me to marry his daughter. Well, okay, I marry his daughter, but what's, there's no meaning to the relationship okay. because I'm not choosing to be with her. If, if from a place of freedom I choose to be in that relationship, then that's a relationship that's really a, that's a meaningful relationship. So I'm assuming that that's the kind of relationship God wants to have with us is a meaningful choosing relationship. Okay, very interesting. So let's let's jump back. We were just we just said that well-being. You were just set up the first idea, which is that there needs to be an other, which means being a yesh, being a prat, being a mitzias. So let's pick up from there. Okay, so then the, the other quality again, we're basing this on our foundation of of why you know this foundation of creation, which undifferentiated one, creating other for the sake of other, experiencing intimacy with one, so that, and then who do we have to be? So we said first we have to be a yesh, we have to individuate, because if we don't individuate, then there's no other to receive the hatava that Hashem wants to bestow upon us. And so we have to be a yesh, but we also have to be the type of yesh that's capable of engaging in intimacy with something greater than ourselves. Right, because that is a hot topic. So we have to be a yesh that's capable of relationship, of intimacy. Excuse me. So that's a whole other category. That's 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 a category of connection, of healthy relationship, of intimacy, of sharing. Um, and I, you know, I say in the workshop also that the first category of yeshness is is on the side of masculinity of being the freedom of independence and the second category and to you know to make a gross generalization is in the category of feminine energy communication intimacy relationship so those are two qualities that we need to be able to embody and there's a third quality as well and that third quality is consciousness in other words um an infant who is a prot, who is an individual, who also engages in intimacy, is not a co-creator of that relationship, and it's also not an appreciative, appreciative recipient of that relationship. So not only do I need to be a prot, not only do I need to be a prot that's capable of being part of a greater qual, but I also need to be a conscious appreciator of the experience and a conscious co-creator of the experience. So those are the three very general categories that I need to be able to embody and what I'm calling well-being. If I'm capable of living a harmonious life, having a harmonious balance between prot and qual, taking care of myself while also being responsible to the relationships that I'm engaged in, as well as understanding principles, right, that's, that's consciousness, and also being in relationship to reality as opposed to being in relationship to reality behind the, the glass of all patterns of thinking. And I know I really haven't described that, but okay. maybe okay. you'll ask me about that. <laughs> let, me, let me just... That might have been a little abstract for for some of the audience. Let me just ask you like this: um, Can you give me a concrete, right? What on this last element of co co creativeness, right? What might a relationship look like 
between a husband and wife that doesn't have that element of co-creative and what right what would it look like with that element of co-creativeness In other words, I am conscious and I am consciously participating in the relationship. Is that kind of what you're... Yes, yeah. So can you give okay, us two so models? Can... Like, you know, John and Lisa and, you know, Mike, whatever. Ruben, okay. Ruben no, and, is... and Leah. Okay. So uh, one is I can be totally unconscious in the relationship. And, and you know, I'm either just thinking about myself or I'm not thinking about myself and I'm totally modeling myself to the relationship and I'm being a, a schmuck and I'm doing all the right things, but I'm just not there. I mean, I'm not, I'm not the one choosing to do that. So th those, are, those are potential imbalances in terms of my protness and my qualness, right? So that those are always, you know, that I, I think of that as a constant GPS type thing that where I'm constantly readjusting do you mean, in other words, you mean uh, when, let's say, a husband feels like there's no space for him in the relationship or he comes home from a long day of work and his wife is like, you know, do the dishes, fold the lawn, whatever, it, whether it's physically or emotionally, um, is that what you sort of mean? Like there's no space for him to just kind of, you know, spread out, relax, take a breath? Yeah, I mean, well, look, look it's... it's Again, it becomes a choice. If I choose to come home and, and my wife is overwhelmed and I'm doing the dishes and taking care of the kids or whatever, that's, you know, that's fine. If it, it, it becomes a, it's a necessity and it's a choice. But there are some guys that I'm sure are living their lives where they're totally out of touch with their own boundaries and they're totally out of touch with their own needs and they're, they're just, they've mavatled themselves to the relationship. But it's not a it's not a choice. It's just it, they're, they're they don't feel like they can say no. In other words, yeah. Or they also then they're, they're walking around as if they don't matter. You know, like in your words, and and they're just they're they have no life of their own. And yet then there's, there's the other extreme where people are imposing themselves on the relationship with the, without any sense of responsibility to the greater relationship, and and that's an imbalance that. That's interesting. Can you can you can you just? I know I keep asking you for examples, but it's just a great way. No, to, that's good. To, to concretize yeah, it's it. Like, I don't I don't care what's needed. I'm going on vacation, or I'm here. I'm gonna go learn. I'm gonna go diving, and I'm right. gonna go learn. And right. that's what I want to do, and that's what I think is important. And I'm not gonna really pay attention to what the needs of my family or my children are. I'm busy being a Torah superstar, and that's what I'm doing. And I could, you know, I could put it under the guise of, well, I'm serving Hashem, but, you know, I think a lot of people are just doing that because they're trying to prove themselves. And it's, it's you know, it becomes a selfish thing. There's a great... So that's an example. There's a... This is a great segue into what I wanted to ask you next, but... There's just a great uh, anecdote where um, this chassid came to the rabba, the late, you know, the Bava Rebbe, and he said um, that he said something to the effect of that he folds, he doesn't fold his talus, and he folds his talus after Avdal in a certain way because there, it's written in Sefer Chassidim that it's a segula for Shalom bias. So the rabba quipped to him that another segula that he knows about for Shalom bias is doing the dishes. Let's say Shabbos. <laughs> Right. So let me ask you this, and I, it's a really sensitive, and and I, it's it's kind of hard to talk about such really complex, real nuanced issues. But let's just try to in such a small time frame. Um, there, a lot of the dialogue on on with my audience, healthy Judaism, that we explore and that I think is implicit in a lot of the things you're saying is that there can be a tension between well-being and halacha at times. Um, let, me, let me give you an example. Um, I had a friend, I had a friend who just came back from a uh, show for two months ago, I think it was, a good friend of mine, 
I told him to go. Uh, a couple of people, you know, suggested he might find it useful, and he went. And it was great for him. It really, I mean, I saw the second after he came back, his posture. I see it a lot in the posture. Like, the physical way he was standing was just, I never saw him stand like that. Um, and it was interesting. So, so he, he was not wearing a, a hat and jacket when I saw him on the street. And I know he always wears a hat and jacket, right? Um, and I said, you know, let's just say his name was Levy, right? I said, Levy, um, how you doing? Whatever, we were talking. And then I, I, I said, by the way, I noticed um, you're not wearing a hat and jacket. It's so interesting. Like, I, because I was curious, I, I thought I might have something to do. And I said, you know, I'm just observing. That's interesting. I never saw you without that. And he said something so interesting, which I think is just an example of, of this possible tension. Now, wearing a hat and jacket is not halakha, which is why I actually think it's a good example. Um, it's a sort of, one might call, extra standard, I, I don't think, whatever it may be. There is a certain, at least, uh, communal conception that wearing a hat and jacket in the street is considered a threshold of extra stringency, you know, always wearing the uniform of a chassid and what have you. So he said that he's not wearing it because the only reason he always wore the hat and jacket was because he was afraid if he doesn't wear the hat and jacket, he's not going to get a shidduch or people will talk bad about him. Um, and now he feels like, he told me, he feels like, he, I think his words were exactly, um, I don't need other people's opinions to tell me I'm, I'm, I'm good enough and I matter. I, I now affirm that to myself and therefore I don't need to wear the hat and jacket. And then it was funny because um, right before that, another friend I spoke to had just come back from Chauffeur and he came over to me with a big smile and he told me that um, he didn't stay up Shua's night. You know, the, the custom to stay up Shua's night and learn all night. So the first year he didn't do it and he didn't do it because every other year he only did it because the kids would make fun of him the next day. And now he felt comfortable enough and safe enough, right, to not go down that path to not take these quote-unquote religious actions solely out of fear of others etc um okay so i i guess i'm just asking um there uh, and, and and it's something that we explore a lot on healthy judaism i've written a lot about it um it's something that i it continuously fascinates me um if you could just speak a couple a couple words about it what you think the framework is for navigating a tension between well-being and and halacha or religious uh obligations that we might have and those examples weren't the best because they're not exactly halacha but uh, if you could just speak about that for a minute Of, of, a, of a greater wisdom 
that I don't necessarily understand. In other words, I, you know, you've probably seen that movie, um, The Karate Kid, where the, you know he's told wax on, wax off, right? Well, he doesn't understand why his sensei is telling him to do that, but and it's a pain in the butt, and he doesn't really understand it. But he has faith in the sensei. The I don't know who I'm talking to again. He has faith in the the karate master that. Um, you know, that he knows best. And even though this, I don't enjoy it, I don't understand it, I'm going to follow it because I really want to become a karate master myself. So from a place of well-being, I would choose, I might, I mean, I'm not telling you to choose this, but, but I would choose to follow halacha because I have faith in Moshe and I have faith in Hashem that this is the system that, 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 that I have an opportunity to align myself with. So, and there, there, there are healthy ways of doing that, and there are only healthy ways. I'm doing that because I'm scared that the community is going to think badly about me. Well, okay, then that's the guy that's doing halacha. The guy that's doing halacha at that instant, and I'm not saying this is the totality of that guy, excuse me, the guy that's doing that halacha is doing it because he's scared of what you're thinking about him. Okay, um, you know, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not putting a judgment on that. I'm just saying that that's what's going on. Or if there's a person who's coming down the pike from a place of well-being, and he decides that he really has a faith and has faith in this system, and he, he's responsible for the greater claw that he's choosing to belong to. I think that's a whole different relationship. And yes, I'm sure there are times. I remember. I remember the specific thing where I was out. I was doing a workshop with um, Rabbi Michal Torsky and his wife, and um, this, it was in Seattle. And and the, this therapist brought up this an example of a guy who had Shabbos forced down his throat, and it was a miserable, horrible experience for him. You know that it was his upbringing. It was horrible, and. This, guy, this therapist was talking about the fact that he encouraged this guy to not keep Shabbat. I don't think he encouraged him to not keep Shabbat. I don't think he did. I think the guy, this kid chose not to keep Shabbos anymore. He needed some perspective, right? Space, yeah. And I, I was watching Rabbi Tversky, and he was like, he, like, he was like this, and Rabbit and Tversky was flipping out, and she was like, oh my God, this is wrong, uh -huh. right? So, Again, I'm, I'm not giving you a, an opinion on it, but, you know, maybe, and, 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 and I never, really, I never tell anyone not to do anything or to do anything. I really try to stay away from that. I'm really focused on this concept of well-being. But I think Rabbi Tversky had some understanding that if this kid kept going down this path of keeping Shabbos in this miserable, resentful way, that that wasn't Shabbos. That's not what Shabbos is about. And then, and again, I'm not putting words in Rabbi Tversky's mouth, but maybe it was like, hey, you know what? You have to step back for a second and, and get into a healthy relationship with Shabbos here. Again, I'm, and I'm not saying totally. that I, I, I'm not putting my own spin on this and giving advice about this at all. I really am very careful not to do that. Sure. But but I think that that very often we're doing halacha from we're not doing halacha because we're in relationship with God. We're doing halacha because we're trying to be trying to show our mother that we're better than our brother or we're you know whatever yeah crazy reason we're engaged in the relationship and i don't know does god need our mitzvahs like that i don't know and i'm but you know and there's a whole issue which you know it's an issue that that whole other conversation what, what what is that if i'm doing a mitzvah if i'm doing halacha for totally the wrong reason like right. I'm doing it because I'm looking, I'm learning Torah because I'm, I'm totally looking to, to impress my mother that I'm smarter than my brother. And that's why I'm learning. I'm just using some stupid example. So what is that? Is it nothing? Is it something? I'm doing, you know, I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing the mitzvah and maybe by doing the mitzvah I will come to a place where I'm actually doing the mitzvah for the right reason. Okay, you know, I 
hear all that, but but I guess the focus in is, you know, and I'm, I'm not telling this guy, I would never tell this guy, don't wear a hat, don't wear a jacket, and that the only important thing is your own well-being. No, that, that's a very... That's a super, you know, that's a, that's a very simplistic way of, of looking at things. That's why in particular, I, I didn't want to put well-being on one side of the equation and a hawk on the other, because I, I know this, this conversation is going on out there in terms of, you know, well, is it well-being or is it halacha? And I don't, I don't want that to be the conversation. It's not, it, it's not what, what you really want to do is you really, you know, from a place of well-being, from a place of freedom, to be vitally engaged in a construct like halacha, again, it, it, you know, it's your choice. You want to be, you want to, you want to, you, you want to follow halacha. Well, you want to follow it from a place of passion and 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 choice and freedom. That's the whole, you know. That's why we macabre the halacha at Har Sinai after we attain freedom from Pesach. In other words, we don't. It, it, it's, that's the whole idea. We're choosing to do that. Yes, there's this idea that Hashem held the mountain over our heads and all that, but I think right. that's simply a function of there were so many miracles that our free choice was taken away to a certain extent. But, but the, the process goes that first we attain freedom, then we macabre the Torah. That's a very, very poignant uh, way you put it in the narrative of the Tzius Mitzrayim first and then I, and, um, yeah, I, I really, that's an interesting story with Rabbi Torsky. Um, something that recently I also discovered, um, which, which, as you say, um, see, well, for me, it was, it was a, a bit revolutionary in the Rabbi's own, uh, own teachings. And much of what we do in healthy Judaism is we try to, we try to explore what the Rabbi's conception of. Of Judaism, I mean, we use I, I use a lot of sources from my marim and sikhs and whatnot, um, but the, the and the, I'll tell you how it came up. Um, just another example was that uh, a friend of mine, um, an acquaintance, uh, well, he's a friend, a good friend actually, who went to a chauffeur. I have a couple of friends who went to chauffeur, um, so this was actually before he went to chauffeur. Um, we were speaking, and he said. And, and I know his parents, and I really know this is the way he was brought up, was that he picked up his yarmulke and he said, I feel like I, my whole life I was told I'm only valuable as long as I wear this piece of velvet on my head, right? This is what makes me valuable. This is what makes me worthy. And if, that, if, if I take that off, um, I've been told implicitly or explicitly that... I'm less worthy. I'm less valuable. Um, and and he was like, "Look, I I I I believe in God. I believe in the Torah, but I need to work my issues out, and I need space from Yamaka." That's what he was telling me. Okay, look, I I was listening. Um, right, like you said, it you can't. What do you tell someone? I mean, so so um. And then Bashkacha Pratis, in, during the next week, I was learning a sicha uh, of the Rebbe, and he speaks about this very interesting concept, which is that we know a child is only obligated in mitzvah from bar mitzvah. And there's absolutely no obligation on him before bar mitzvah. And the Rebbe was asking, um, right, why, how could it be that there's no obligation on a kid before, bar, before he's 13? If there's absolutely no obligation, it's impossible he won't mess up after 13. It's impossible. Because he's just taking everything on right away. And yes, kids are inducted into it a little bit early or whatever. But, but the point was like conceptually, how could Torah envision a kid keeping perfectly Torah mitzvahs from 13 if he wasn't obligated beforehand? And the answer he came up with was to me very on point and very suggestive. I'm not sure what to do with it, but it's just something to think about. Um, which was that Torah doesn't demand or doesn't expect a 13-year-old to keep Torah mitzvahs perfectly. Torah knows that he will mess up after 13 because it's impossible not to if you're taking everything on right then. But the mess ups are expected and embraced. And he says that it's not even in the category of an onus. It's not like an onus where we say like it was beyond the kid's control because he didn't have any familiarity with it beforehand and now it's like he's exempt in the eyes of the law. No, this is part of the mitzvah, the mess up. 
And I, I called my friend, I told it to him, whatever. Um, but but I, I think, look, I think it's a very complicated issue. Um, and I think it's something that a lot of people I know struggle with. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult, you know? Um, I think a good example, like, would be, let's, let's say, like, you know, a husband's having friends over and, you know, he's not the best husband, maybe, to his wife. And she asks him in front of company to, like, let's say, do the dishes. And he wants to show off, you know, how responsive and great he is. So he's doing the dishes. And it's, but the, the, his fulfilling the needs, the requests of the other in that relationship is completely not about responding to the needs of the other in that moment. But it is actually getting done. So there is that interplay, which is uh, something to, you know, to explore and play with. Um, okay, I mean, th that's a good example. And, and, okay, so let's say the dishes are getting done, and that's, that's a good thing. And ultimately, you know, really what you, what you would want is for him to want to do the dishes, whether he's showing off to his friend or, no, not whether not to show off to his friends, but out of a compassionate place for his wife. And that's, you know, okay, so, you know, you want to measure, well, this is worth 30 points and this is worth 60 points. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how to do right. that. Right. But I think we could all agree that the, the intention is that he shouldn't be performing this action to show off to his friends, but the intention should be one of, you know, help and compassion and giving, right? So... Okay, so how to get there? I don't know. It almost seems like as long as he's generating his life from this need to show off to his friends, and, he, and that's more important than helping his wife, as long as that's what's, what, what's the, 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 the modus operandi that's generating his life, and he's able to satisfy that, you know, he's able to get away with that, you know, he could spend his rest, the rest of his life doing that. You know, <laughs> doing dishes because he's impressing his friends. Right. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's a good question. Right? Okay. So, but, but I think we could all agree that, that, that nobody wants that. that. I think we can all agree it's not that, optimal. that the guy that, that you know, that you want the guy. Not only do we want the guy to be doing that, not only do, do, does his wife want him to be coming from that place, but I think we can all agree that the essence of the guy is that he would want to do it from that place. Simcha, let's, uh, I just wanted to maybe end off with three questions from, that people sent in. Um, does that sound good? Sure. Okay, great. Uh, the first question is um yeah chauffeur is done the workshops i've been told this is, are done in groups uh why is it necessary to get so vul vulnerable in front of groups Thank you. 
intimacy. And um, and that's a very that's a scary place to go. And if you're in the container of other people that are also in touch with that in themselves, it becomes a safer place to go. It becomes a safe place to go there. So you're saying that seeing other people go there makes it easier to follow? Well, not exactly. I, I would say that there's a certain there's a certain amplitude. Amplitude means volume. Um, if you play like if a lot of notes are being played at the same time, there's a greater amplitude or volume. And um, a lot of the workshop is allowing an individual to really resonate with that which is really fundamental. Like, I'll give you a bad example. Let's say I have a desire, I'm jealous, so I have a desire to, you know, scrape your fancy new car. You know, I'm going to damage your car. Well, okay, that's a desire, you know, I'm angry and jealous and I'm going to scratch your car. Well, really, if I dig down deeper, really, I want to be, I want attention. I want to be loved for who I am. I don't really want to hurt you. I don't really need to take attention away from you. I don't need to lower you in order to raise myself. That's not my, my fundamental real desire to damage you. My real desire is to be loved for who I am and for someone to pay attention to who I am. So the, the, the workshop allows me to drill down deep enough into my deeper desire. Um, and if you walk into a container, and that, that's part of the, 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 the structure of the workshop is that there's a, it's a container that's constructed, excuse me, from past participants. And very often there's probably half as many staff as there are participants. And that container is constructed before the participants come. And that con container is constructed by men who are in touch with these desires. And that's the type of container and it, this individual walks into, and it really makes his transformation possible. It makes it possible for him to get in touch with his root desire as well. I know that was a bit abstract. But... <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I mean, it's interesting. Look, I, I, you know, after my experience uh, in Chauffeur, I was thinking reflecting how to describe it to someone and I really thought like good way to describe it is like I, again it's a gross generalization but um kind of packing a year of of real therapy into a weekend um and sort of shaking dust off and then standing you up and like all right you know all your dust is off like now you're ready to really do the real work um but I myself have gone to therapy in the past. Um, you know, it's hard really exposing your vulnerabilities, your imperfections, your weaknesses, even to one other person. And people spend years in therapy without really opening up sometimes. Um, just, you know, a year, like getting comfortable with their therapist. I mean, that's very common. And here you have people in front of groups and just really, really getting real in a very present way, without any filters, just showing themselves and all their, in all their pain, all their hurt. Um, it's, I, I just, it's, it's kind of amazing that that's able to happen on the weekend. Well, and one of the, one of the, um, one of the functions of that is a group, is a container. And, and very simply, I'm, you know, you've heard me say this before, that, that, 95% of what goes on there is simply listening. You know, it's it's really just listening. And listening allows someone, you know, I, I, I say this, is like being a midwife, allowing someone to give birth to him or herself. And that's really what, you know, because if you really listen, people will share their deepest desire. And it, it, it creates that safety. That, well, what do you really want? What is it that you're really here for? What is it that you're really saying? And if you listen from that place, that's what you start to hear. Hmm. Hey, guys.
Got it. Well, Simcha, um, if people want to sign up, how, what's the best way? Um, I, I think the best way is to go on the website, okay. which is calloftheshofar.org, and I'm sure um, that there's a number or some button to press or something. I, <laughs> truth is, I have no idea. Okay. I've never registered, so I okay, don't fine. Know, but I'm sure that's the way to do it, calloftheshofar.org. I'll also put in the in the newsletter um, Penny's email for people is that the best? Yeah, yeah, if you could do that that'd be great. I don't even know what it's probably Penny at all the show for dot org. I, yeah. I really don't know. Yeah. So um Simcha, thank you so much for making time to do this interview. Uh, I'm very honored and have a great day.